What's up, guys? Luke back again with another Week in Review podcast where we talk about the things that have interested us in the world of video games each and every week. But without any further ado, let's get right into it. Little bit of hacking news. Uh, The notorious group, uh, according to an article written by The Verge, Team Executor, two of their heads uh, on uh, Team Executor were actually arrested in, uh, not Puerto Rico, uh, Dominican, I want to say Dominican Republic. They were actually arrested and are currently being extradited out to the United States. Uh, if you don't know who Team Executor is, they are a very big mod chip making company. Um, I have been using their products since as long as I can remember, since I, really I started modding um, original Xboxes and Xbox 360s. Um, if you guys remember back in the day when the original Xbox was getting hacked by everybody and their cousin, everyone had an uncle except for me, of course, and maybe a couple of you guys let me know in the comments. Um, everyone and their uncle had that, had that crazy uncle that like modded the crap out of their original Xbox. They had like tons of games on it and it was so cool for a 10 year old, 13 year old kid to, uh, go over to your buddy's house and he had all these games. They were all loaded on his Xbox and you don't know how the heck he did it. Um, so that was a really fun time and chances are that Xbox may, uh, was probably hacked by a team executor mod chip um so uh this one is kind of hitting me a little bit personally um i do use team executors prod uh uh, products i don't use them for piracy i use them for backing up i want to make that very very clear i use them for backing up as well as running emulators on consoles and games that i already own i do not condone piracy however i do condone you owning a system, you paying legal tender for a system and owning it and being able to do whatever the you want with the system. Excuse my language. It was bleeped, but seriously, like you should be able to do whatever the heck you want with us, with your system once you've purchased it. Um, so if that means hacking the system to run backups on your system, having a physical copy of your collection, as well as having it on an SD card, that's your right to do it in my opinion. But there is kind of the uh, other side of the coin where, you know, uh, a lot of people that do get these uh, these mod chips do use them for hacking. Um, and it's gotten really uh, serious guys. Like uh, team executor was selling products that were, uh, able to be used to hack your system. And that's where the rub was typically with, uh, uh, situations like this, a company has no real bearing if they, uh, if the, um, the information is open source, right? So like someone puts it out there, it's open source. Um, anyone can have access to the information, um, and no one's profiting off of the hack. There really isn't a whole lot of, validity to hold up in court but with team executor they sell their products they sell uh licenses to their products uh for their custom firmware as well as uh the tools that are needed to exploit the nintendo switch is what we're talking about because nintendo is cracking down on the entire hacking scene as well as the rom rom sites and many other uh forms of of just switch modding where um you know piracy is involved so um uh yeah this is really really bad news for team executor guys i don't know if we're ever going to see them again um but two of their uh two of their heads were arrested in the dominican republic and uh this is basically the statement from the justice department I know I'm I sound like the actual news right now, but the uh, just uh, uh, these defendants were uh, allegedly leaders of a notorious international crime group that reaped illegal profits for years by pirating video game technology of U.S. companies. Brian C. Rabbit, the acting assistant attorney general of the Justice Department's criminal division, said in a statement, these arrests show that the department will hold accountable hackers who seek to commandeer and exploit 
intellectual property of American companies for financial gain, no matter where they may be located. And and the key word here is seek to exploit the intellectual property of American companies for financial gain. I think if you took the financial gain out, we wouldn't be talking about this right now. But Team Executor, they're out to make a profit. They're out to make money. And, you know, they ran the risk of, of being put in this situation. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt that Nintendo was throwing some money towards uh, this in some way, shape, or form um, for the way that they kind of stated everything. These are notorious international crime, a criminal group. Like, come on, guys. They're modding switches. They're not, like, some notorious, like... They act like they've been on the run. They're like the most wanted in America and like things like that. The way that this is stated is very, um, very strategic in my opinion. Uh, they went on to say the Justice, uh, Justice Department tries uh, to emphasize the difference between uh, executors' uh, activities and not-for-profit emulation or console hacking. The, uh, the release says Executor attempted to protect its overall business by using a wide variety of b uh, brands, websites, and distribution channels. Come on. Every business, every company, even Nintendo, uses a wide, brand, uh, wide um, variety of distribution. Come on. Walmart, GameStop, Target, Costco... Best Buy, Amazon, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So, come on, we can take this part for a bit of a grain of salt. They're just really kind of just rubbing salt into the wound. Um, but uh, by using a wide variety of bands, website, uh, so according to the indictment, and that, that the group cloaked its illegal activity with a with a purported desire to support gaming enthusiasts who wanted to des design their own video games for non-commercial use. But the primary purpose of the group's activities was to develop and sell for profit tools for running pirated games and additionally to help create and support online libraries of pirated games. That last sentence, in my opinion, is an absolute bold-faced lie to the press, Team Executor never tried to create online libraries libraries of pirated games. Like, they would have to be nuts to do something like that. So there's a lot of extra lies in here that um, really I don't think line up with Team Executor and what they were trying to do. Yes, they did develop, because I have a, a modded Switch myself. I run SXOS on my modded Switch. Um, it's something that I'm very familiar with. They did add a program where you can dump your own games, a game that you own, a physical copy of a game that you own. You can dump that onto an SD card. It's a phenomenal tool. It came in big handy, and I'll give you an example. came in big handy when I wanted to take my collection across the world to Thailand to play it while I was on the go and not have to carry around all these different carts. I had a big SD card. I dumped all my games that I personally own in my collection onto the SD card, and I went across the country and, or uh, across the world to Thailand, and I enjoyed those games while I was in Thailand. I had way more of a library than I would have had if I had to lug, lug around all these carts. So what they're saying here and what executor was team executor was actually doing and what they could actually, I believe could hold up in court is two different things. Um, I think for sure there's going to be a settlement taking place where team executor will have to cease basically cease and desist all their projects. You know, the company is dissolved. It's, it's no longer a thing. Um, so there's going to be some sort of settlement taking place, but I don't think it's nearly as bad as what the media has kind of made it out to be. Um, it really sucks that they've kind of, you know, they've kind of criminalized, um, using, you know, using hacks on 
product that you already own. Like, it's none of Nintendo's business what you do with your own system. It is their business if you're stealing games. So that's a totally, those are two totally different subjects that Nintendo's kind of compiled into one. And their argument is, well, it, the product that Team Executor is selling can be used for pirating games. But it's not marketed as such. It's not marketed that it is, uh, like, that you, uh, that you, that, it's not marketed that you, it can be used for pirated games. It's just another feature of having a hack switch. So I think it's a big mess. I think it sucks. Um, Team Executor um, has been a company that I have gone, gone to every time they come out with a new product. Um, I was always all over it because it's fun. I love modding consoles. Uh, so definitely look for a, a future video where I kind of outline what it's like to have a modded Switch and the legal and clean things that you can do. Hopefully Nintendo doesn't come after me, but um, uh, I, we'll make it we'll make it we'll make it a little covert. <laughs> but uh, I I don't know it's a big mess. I'm not I'm not excited. I'm bummed. Um, but you know one thing was kind of funny. Um, one of the two that were arrested, uh, the guy's last name is Bowser. <laughs> so Bowser, <laughs> Bowser was arrested for hacking uh, Nintendo Switches. <laughs> I just thought that was kind of funny. Uh, moving on, Sega Talks mini consoles. In a recent interview, the subject of uh, future mini consoles came up, and they had something interesting to say. The If you guys don't know already, uh, Sega just released a, a Game Gear Micro. It was a Japan-only release. Uh, they came they came out. They're about the size of the palm of your hand. No, They're actually uh, no bigger than the VMU unit, if you remember from Sega Dreamcast days. No bigger than that. And it was, um, you know, I mean, it's a Game Gear. Like, they're cool, I guess. Some of us had them. You know, obviously, some of us had them. We, they sold about 10 million units, um, which is nothing, you know, that impressive. But, you know, I, I guess it was more of a thing in Japan, so why not, I, I guess. But um, uh, Sega is also looking to the future, too, and making uh, different mini consoles and what they had to say was the Game Gear Micro is only sold domestically in Japan. When we do when we do the next one, I feel like the project scope will be much bigger as we gaze upon the world. So we won't be able to release uh, release it at this time, the next year, or or two years after the Mega Drive Mini. Uh, we can't make it that quickly. So um, that's good. Looks like they're you know gonna dig into something that's. Uh, a little more fleshed out, maybe a little more popular. I think for the next one, we may have to go with a con uh, with a concept close to the Mega Drive Mini. If I have if I have to say some names, it would be an SG One Thousand Mini or a Dreamcast Mini. If you don't know what the SG One Thousand Mini is, it predates the Sega Master System. Uh, uh, I don't know anyone that had it. I've never seen it. Um, um, but you know. Still, still kind of cool. I think it'd be really awesome if uh, um, they did something like that. But I think it's gonna be a Dreamcast Mini. Come on, guys! Like that's what everyone wants, and I think that Sega knows that. I hope, and uh, I think we can definitely look forward to a Dreamcast Mini. Maybe in the next couple of years, we'll see. We can speculate for now. I'm really excited. I love Sega. Limited Run News. Um, so if you guys don't know yet, I love LimitedRun.com, and I kind of want to make this a thing that we do every single week where I basically go over uh, just kind of briefly Limited Run News, what's going on with the website, what games are coming uh, are going to be going live this week, as well as games that are coming down and have last chance offers. Um, so we're just going to kind of go through these each and every week. Uh, but the first one is we have last chances for all the Shantae games. Uh, original Shantae on Switch and Game Boy Color Original and the Collector's Editions. So um, all those uh, all those are going to be last chance as well as Risky's Revenge on Switch, Regular, and Collector's. 
and Half Genie Hero on PS4 and Switch, just regular only. And then uh, the last day to pick them up will be October 11th, which which is this coming Monday, or no, this coming Sunday. So um, at the time of this recording, that's a couple of days. Uh, so um, not much time. It may be when this video releases, it may be the last day to pick up the Shantae game. So if you're watching this the day it comes out, run over to Limited Run if you haven't yet and pick up the Shantae games, especially the Game Boy Color release. If I was going to get one out of everything that is offered, I'd get the Game Boy Color release. That game is super rare. It's hard to find uh, in, in its original form, and it's about a $550 game. So it's worth the investment. They're selling them for about $45. Bucks. Um, if you have the money, go over and get it. Uh, this weekend, uh, to, uh, starting tomorrow, which is a Friday at the time of this recording, uh, October 9th, we're going to be getting two new games available for pre-order. They're not like super, um, you know, right away sort of uh, releases uh, where you have to be up at, you know, the crack of dawn and, you know, have everything ready in your cart and stuff. They're 30, 30 day long pre-orders, which I love, by the way. Um, I mean, it's a little less exclusive, I guess, but with how big limited run has gotten, I think it's great. They give you 30 days to get your affairs in order and buy, buy the new game that's out. The two games that we got are Chasm. Chasm's a Castlevania indie style game with procedurally generated rooms. Uh, the map structure is the same no matter who's playing it. Uh, so the map structure is the same, but each room is procedurally generated every time you go through it, which creates different experiences. Um, so that's kind of fun. Like you may encounter different enemies. You may encounter more enemies. You may encounter less enemies. And it's very much so in the same um, style as the uh, Castlevania games from the NES. So, or uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, early 2000s. So Symphony of the Night, that sort of um, that sort of vein. So uh, super good. If you're a big Castlevania fan, I would definitely check this one out. Uh, it has a classic edition and a regular edition. It's going to be released on the Switch and PS4. Uh, and the classic edition comes with a lot of stuff. Um, it comes with the game. or So it comes with the box, obviously, the collector's box, the game, stickers, a four-disc soundtrack, an art book, buttons, three buttons, a 18 by 24 reversible poster, and a cute little familiar bird plush. So it comes with a lot of stuff, and it's quite affordable. The classic edition is going to be $69.99, and the regular edition will be $34.99. So um, very affordable for that classic edition. If uh, Metroidvania-style games um, are your are your jam, I would definitely buy the classic edition. Um, it's going to obviously have that nice resale value if you ever need it. But also, it comes with a lot of stuff. I think it's a pretty good value. Um, also, they're going to be releasing the uh, soundtrack in vinyl form as well. Okay, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to read this. The title of this um, next game. Forgive me if I get it wrong. It's Briganadine. Briganadine. Wait, Bri. Brigandine. Brigandine. We're gonna call it that. The Legend of Rumercia. Rumercia. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this one is a story-driven, heavily tactical RPG, and this is a type of game for a person that is very invested in tactical RPGs. Guys like me that occasionally play them, uh, Fire Emblem games, my favorite tactical RPG game is Mario Rabbids. That should tell you enough there. Um, so I'm more of an elementary uh, tactical RPG player. I do enjoy them, but this game is going to be not for guys like me that aren't big into tactical RPGs, but enjoy them once in a while. This game is uh, very much so being... Um, kind of put off as a very uh very involved rpg that can even be become overwhelming for a lot of people when you fire it up so if you're heavy into tactical rpgs i think this is one that you could 
definitely check out. I think it's probably one that you would absolutely love um, because it does offer that extra you know, level of difficulty. So um, if you just play Fire Emblem, maybe not touch this one. Um, this is more for the hardcore. Uh, it's a PS4 only release uh, for regular and collector's edition. The collector's comes with a collector's box, a game, an 18 by 24 reversible poster, CD soundtrack, and enamel pin. And the regular is going regular edition is going for forty nine ninety nine, and the collectors is going for seventy four ninety nine. This last one I'm the most excited about from all the news from today, guys. Uh, we have a um, uh, new game coming out. Uh, well, it's not a new game; it's already been released, but it, the physical edition is coming, and it is called Iron Fury. And if you've never heard of Iron Fury, this is a Game that is a very much so a spiritual successor to Duke Nukem 3D. Um, it's very much so like Shadow Warrior uh, style of FPS, nu Duke Nukem, or even Doom, the original Doom games. Um, very much so an arena sort of FPS from back in the day. Looks amazing. It, it's uh, it's it's a technical uh, masterpiece in my opinion. Um, they even use the original um, the original engines to make this thing work so it's almost like this game was made back then too and then just brought up to today's standard which is really cool kudos um and it just looks awesome guys like i i, I want to pick this one up i'm really excited for it uh the pre-order goes live uh in uh, a couple of days it comes live goes live on tuesday october 13th which by the way why <laughs> why on a tuesday i don't know but it is a 30 day or so maybe even longer um release it's not a limited run game it's just a publisher that limited run uh, distributes for um which is really cool um so this one will probably be around for a while but just wanted to let you guys know also there's going to be a switch and ps4 version only uh just a heads up switch is locked at 30 fps um, if you do, but uh, you can actually unlock it by doing the Konami code in the game, uh, then it'll be an uncapped FPS. So if you're a big guy on 60 FPS for your F or yeah, if you're a big guy on 60 FPSs for your FPSs uh, or <laughs> sure, we'll go with that. If you're big on 60 FPS, you probably want to get the PS4 version because that one is locked at 60 FPS and holds steady. Um, just a little technical information for you guys. And it does come with a little sticker sheet if you pre-order the game. I know it's not much, but hey, at least you get a little goodie for pre-ordering the game. Okay, moving on, guys. That's that's the small news. Let's get into the big news now. Uh, first thing we want to talk about is Microsoft's third-party expandable storage. Um, just uh, just the other day, Jason uh, Jason Renald uh, was uh, the he's the project manager for the Xbox Series X. The dude with the really long beard. Like, you know the guy, right? Like, from the Xbox Showcase. It's a dude with a really long beard. Um, he said that the uh, Seagate drives, um, we talked about this actually a few weeks ago. These things are, are really expensive. They're $220 for a one terabyte um, uh, Seagate drive for mem for storage expansion. And a lot of people have been kind of bummed out about that. Um, and for me as well, like, that's like the, the only downside i feel to investing in the xbox is the uh expandable storage is expensive but he had this to say he said that seagate was um uh was the seagate drive was to make sure that they had expandable storage at launch but to expect more options in the foreseeable future. So that basically opens up the door for poss the possibility of having third-party uh, expandable storages from different companies that make storages as well. So um, hopefully we will see some third-party options that are more affordable and kind of give us the, um, you know, the ability to upgrade our storage without breaking the bank. Um, so that's a really exciting news. Um, I think that kind of sort of solves the problem. We're still going to have an issue at launch, 
But um, over the next couple of years too, guys, as this technology gets um, more and more uh, inexpensive, as we've seen it become more and more inexpensive, uh, this stuff is going to come down. And, you know, as the technology gets older, obviously it gets cheaper. So we're going to see storages uh, that are more affordable, um, especially around the holidays when Black Friday's going on, uh, Cyber Monday, stuff like that. It's going to get more more affordable. Um, it's just something that we kind of have to deal with at launch and probably for the first two, three years, something like that. So it still sucks, but it could be worse. And finally, uh, Sony uploaded a PS5 teardown uh, showcase onto YouTube uh, earlier this week. And I kind of wrote down some of the stuff that I'm really excited for. Um, and I wanted to kind of share it with you. So the first thing was there's a USB-C, a USB Type-C port on the front of the PS5 console, um, which I thought was interesting. I, I didn't, I actually didn't see that in the original reveal. Um, I thought there were just two USB ports on the front of it, but it's fun that they're using that new standard of USB-C ports. Maybe for maybe that's for VR, future VR connectors, maybe PSVR 2. Uh, we'll see. That sounds that seems kind of cool and seems like it would make sense, uh, especially because they actually didn't add a PlayStation VR camera slot or plug in the back or front of the system. And they just announced uh, uh, the other day when people started to ask questions um, where is that port? They basically, uh, they basically responded with, well, we're going to have an adapter that's no cost to anybody. Um, if you have a PSVR, you can get the adapter and then your, uh, PlayStation camera will work with your PS5. So that's really good. They're going to, of course, support the original PSVR. Um, and hopefully the future, uh, PSVR two will be USB, uh, type C. So we'll see about that. But uh, the stand, uh, the system stands vertical and horizontal with a sort of like, uh, sort of like it's a stand <laughs> um, and it locks into place with a screwdriver. And uh, I mean, I have to say, like, there's no way you're going to make me lay this thing down flat. It looks terrible when it's laid down flat. Um, also, it looks like it's kind of impeding on some of the ventilation as well with the console. And yeah, I, I don't think I'll be moving that thing anytime soon. But if I was in a pinch and I needed to, I couldn't stand my system up vertically. I guess that would suffice. But man, does it look ugly. And speaking of ugly, the system just looks ugly. It's not a good looking system. In my opinion, go ahead, fight me in the comments. Uh... Uh, you know, say whatever you want, but seeing this thing up close, seeing it far away, seeing it, you know, medium shots of it, it looks awful. Like this thing is ugly and um, it's huge. The thing's massive. Um, I do not know what Sony was thinking when they designed this thing. However, aside from the aesthetic of it, it is a pretty well-designed console. Uh, the side pa panels do slide off. So those of us that were speculating that maybe possibly we might have some like collector's edition side panels um in the future when like first party titles come out you know typically they'll do a uh you know special edition console and you have to pay you know four hundred dollars to get this console and it's like sold out really quick and it's just a giant mess well they could kind of mitigate that issue by selling collector's editions or sort of like special or limited editions of first party games that come with replacement side panels. Um, so that is still a very, very viable possibility. Keep crossing our fingers. Um, also the fan, uh, fan and storage expansion is accessible. This is really cool. Fan and storage expansion is accessible even uh, or uh, without voiding the warranty. So you don't have to break the warranty sticker seal in order to clean out your console. So you can uh, you can actually unscrew and take out the fan 
without breaking that seal and it opens a pretty large hole where you can get down in there with a uh, air compressor or a, a, a little bit of canned air and blow out the dust that has kind of accumulated on your heat sink, which is cool. Very good. Very good design choice. Um, as well as it has an NVMe expandable SSD slot um, that is PCIe uh, uh, 4.0. So it's basically up to the computer standard. Um, and we're still not sure exactly how many uh, different brands or types of NVMe SSDs will be supported here, but it is really nice that they are using kind of the standard instead of going the Microsoft route where they made a proprietary uh, memory slot. Seems like Sony learned their lesson on that. They haven't done that in a few generations now, and I think everyone's very happy about that. So onboard SSD. Um, uh, uh, so the next thing is, uh, the onboard SSD, um, there's, it's going to be built in, the memory is going to be built into the console and, um, this bums me out. Um, this is not something that I'm excited for. A lot of people have been excited for onboard SSD. Um, it, I guess it's all together in unison. But what happens when your SSD dies? Hard drives die. There's a lot of reading and writing taking place on these hard drives. So as a repair guy, a person that has a background in repair and does it on almost a daily basis, um, at least problem solving is the main thing I do these days. Uh, but uh, I am no stranger to turning the wrench. You guys have seen um, some of our repair videos. Um, so... The fact that this is on board means that if your SSD dies, I'm pretty sure if your SSD dies, you're kind of screwed. Um, I don't know if you can buy these chips and replace them. Um, you'd probably need to have a, a BGA workstation, which are very expensive. Um, it's going to be sort of repair unfriendly, I think. Um, and I think that was part of the strategy when they were designing this console because it has a it's separate proprietary controller as well. So if that goes kapooey, you're, you're done. Like, you're not going to fix your PlayStation because you can't just swap them out because I guarantee they're all married. That's what they like to do is they like to marry all these chips together. So you can't just take a parts console and swap out the chip because it's married to four other chips on the board. So it's very repair unfriendly, um, which is nothing new. These companies have been trying to get third-party repair places to uh, stop their practice for a very long time. This is just another baby step towards that, which I'm bummed about. But we'll see. Um, it could be a lot. Uh, it, it could be not quite as as bad as we think, especially if there's some sort of onboard NAND or a different way to hold on to the OS. Um, and you know, we'll just have to see as time goes on. Uh, a couple more things: liquid metal cooling for the APU. Uh, this is really nerdy stuff, I know, guys, but um, I feel like I want to share it. Um, I feel like. The PS5 has been very, um, they've, Sony's done a really good job. Um, I know I just got done ragging on the aesthetic, but the engineering on this and, and putting this, this together, um, they've done a really good job and they've sp paid a sp uh, special uh, attention to the cooling of the system. Big old fan, um, the console is very well ventilated it's big and it's ventilated very well um the accessibility to cleaning out dust in it is, is it's very accessible to that without voiding your warranty and to cool their chips and to uh, uh for their thermal compound they're actually using liquid metal which is kind of a it's a relatively new practice that of of from what I know, um, to cool systems. And it's basically a, um, substance that it's just, it's, it's exactly what it, what it sounds like. It's liquid metal that you spread on top of your chip and it makes a seal with your heat sink. And it's supposed to dissipate heat about three to four degrees better than normal thermal paste compounds. So, 
Um, I like that they paid the special attention to that and making sure that the system is running cool at launch. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, we won't have any overheating issues on the early days of the PS5. Um, God knows they've certainly done everything to make sure of that. And lastly, the heat sink is absolutely huge. It's, uh, it's copper on the bottom, which is kind of required if you're using liquid metal. And it's got tons of fins and pipes and just a ton of way for heat to dissipate and just be blown out of the back of the system. So um, this thing's going to stay really cool. So that's very, very exciting stuff. And that's going to do it for the news, guys. But we still have the comment of the week. And this week, the winner comes from our uh, Why Nintendo Sucks at Making Game Consoles Part 2 video. If you haven't seen it, links in the cards. Go and see it. Go check out what, what all the fuss is about. It's almost got about 200 views, which doesn't sound uh, like it's very much um, if you're new to the channel. But that's a big deal for us. We don't usually get that many views on a video so go and check it out it's fun and entertaining we had a blast putting it together but this one comes from walther penne uh, that's how i'm gonna pronounce it sorry if i messed up your name walther penne says if you ask me the wii u was a good design console it didn't have a breaking controller it had uh, uh it had real games and not just ports or cheap tetris like games uh that were full price and had backwards compatibility to allow me to play older games if i still own them even via homebrew using gamecube roms without having to rely on poor emulation so basically what he said there was um it's backwards compatible um it with uh, original wii as well as through homebrew through modding and hacking just like we said earlier um, you can play your original gamecube games as well and if you have the game and you download the rom i don't see anything wrong with that if you already own a physical copy of the game and then you can play it without emulation it's not a um it's it's a hardware based um sort of emulation and I, i'm not sure how valid that is i think i think it makes sense because we and GameCube use the same sort of hardware. So um, that does make a lot of sense because you can already play Wii games on the Wii U. So um, as long as the Wii U is not emulating the Wii and its actual uh, actual hardware, that's a really good point. That's the only system I know of, aside from maybe the Game Boy Advanced that played Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, and original Game Boy that would be compatible with three generations of console through hardware emul or no no uh, that was hardware based and not emulation based so amazing point walther thank you so much for the comment um that yeah you made you made an awesome point thank you for brightening brightening up my comments too um just kind of hit me with a, a bunch of long extended comments i really do appreciate that and guys once again if you want to be a part of the comment of the week you gotta be a commenter so thank you one once again walther uh for your comment and i hope to see more from you in the future But that's going to do it for this week's podcast, guys. If you got value out of this video, do me a big favor and smash like as well as subscribe with bell notifications turned on for more content like this. And lastly, I want to hear from you guys. What do you think about the new PS5 teardown? Do you think that the console is going to be good? Do you think it's ugly like I do? Let me know. Also, the Xbox uh, storage expansion, does that give you a little more hope? for the possibility of adding multiple terabytes to your console storage in the future. And lastly, what do you think about Team Executor, two of their top guys being arrested? Uh, Nintendo sent out the feds to go and arrest Bowser for hacking Switch consoles. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. But until next time, guys, Luke from 8-Bit Plus, Signing out, and I'll see you in the next one. God bless.